materials like we do today. And as a result of that, um, you know, they would feed on anything that was plant made, particularly cotton. So these insects still could be a problem in other parts of the world uh, where they do considerable damage to crops. But what we have coming out here in probably the next month uh, are not going to be locusts. Uh, cicadas, of course, have a piercing, sucking mouth part. As you can see there in that upper left picture, it's basically just kind of a long tube-like structure. We call it a proboscis uh, that's used for tapping into plants and feeding on plant sap. Uh, the adults will do a little bit of feeding, but nothing really major, nothing like you might see on your plants like an aphid or a mite or some of the other sap feeding animals. And even though they do tend to come out and appear to be in swarms, they really emerge as individuals. Uh, they may gather, like you see in that lower left picture, on plants in large numbers. But in reality, they really are coming out as an individual insect. Uh, next slide, please. So where are the cicadas going to be? Well, first of all, the, the uh, map on the left, uh, the multicolored one there, you can see that there's a wide variety of colors. And of course, those all are... Uh, correspond with the various broods. Uh, there's a number of 17-year broods, as you can see, a good number of those in the northern part of the United States. Uh, and then we have a few that are on the 13-year cycle. Uh, so the two we're going to focus on the colors would be the brown that you see there, which is going to be the northern half of uh, Illinois, a little bit of extreme northwest corner of Indiana, and then just a few counties up there in southern Michigan. And then uh, we'll be sharing some of our cicadas with the Iowa folks over in Northeast Iowa and Southern Wisconsin. But the bulk of them will be coming out uh, here in the uh, Northern part of the state. Then the light blue, uh, you can see has a very extensive distribution, but the heaviest there is in Southern Illinois and of course a good portion of Missouri as well. The only areas of Illinois that will not really be impacted uh, by this uh, event is in extreme Southern Illinois. You can see there with the green and that group uh, basically came out in 2015. So they're not due until 2028 because they're on a 13 year cycle. Now you may have read in the media or heard on the news. In fact, there was a uh, news item today uh, uh, that I saw on the internet talking about the cicadas and we're all going to be uh, inundated with them and the world's coming to an end. Uh, I can reassure you that's not going to happen. Uh, we will have a slight overlap of the two broods um, in central Illinois. And by that, I'm talking about basically an area just, just north of Springfield. If you're familiar with uh, that area of the state, we're talking Petersburg and where the uh, Lincoln sites are located and just kind of a, a small band, narrow band to the east towards Decatur. And then you can see there's a little... Uh, kind of an upturn there in East Central Illinois, primarily in Ford County and a few of those counties where we'll see both the 13 and the 17 emerging. And that's when it's really going to get noisy. Uh, I remember in 1998, I was in Kansas City visiting my parents where I grew up and uh, we had an overlap there, both the 13 and the 17 there. And if you're more than a few feet away from someone, you'd have to be literally yelling at them to be able to be heard because it was quite, quite noisy. So that's the distribution we're going to see here in Illinois. Uh, the map on your right there, uh, it's not quite as colorful, but it does give a pretty good indication there of uh, the uh, northern and southern broods. And again, you can see that area through central Illinois, it's going to have a little bit of an overlap area. I don't think it'll be a real large area, but where it does occur, it is going to be quite quite the event. Uh, next slide, please. So the thing that's really interesting about all of this is this has not occurred uh, in over 200 years. You'll see there on the slide, it's extremely rare for both of these uh, broods to overlap. Uh, mathematically, they're all on a different schedule. But the last time this happened was when Thomas Jefferson sent Lewis and Clark to the Pacific Northwest to kind of find out what he bought. Uh, if you've studied Thomas Jefferson and history that period of time, you know that he had a lot of critics that thought he had spent an exorbitant amount of money on land that was worthless. 
Uh, a lot of people thought the interior part of the United States was desert and arid and uninhabitable. And of course, we know that they were totally wrong on that. It's one of the most productive agricultural areas in the world. And so that when he sent Lewis and Clark uh, to the Northwest, that's the last time this actually occurred here. Now they did leave, again, if you studied Lewis and Clark, you know they left from down, <clears throat> excuse me, on the Illinois side of the Missouri River and headed up the Missouri. Uh, there's a historic site down there just uh, in that general area, just near Alton and that area, if you're ever down there, it's quite interesting. But uh, I, it'd be interesting to know if it was pretty noisy down there for them at that time, because that's um, would be about May, late April, early May, when they actually started out on their journey. So they may have experienced it. I've not read anything in their accounts to indicate that, but um, uh, they may have may have experienced that emergence or were slightly ahead of it. Uh, next slide, please. So there are uh, different species involved here. Uh, the Northern Brood, uh, Brood 13, has three species. They are separate species ecologically. Uh, and in the Great Southern Brood, which is the Brood 19, has four species. There is some indication that the uh, groups can interbreed, but they do maintain their distinctive uh, species classification. And I know this may sound a little uh, hokey to some people, but when these do come out, and if you're listening really carefully, I, you know, really focused, you can actually tell the difference. You can detect differences. Uh, and the frequency of their of their calling, as we call it, uh, between the different species. So, you know, if you're out and about when these are out, uh, you know, later next month, you might uh, tune in and see if you can pick them out. The calling is that noise, what we call the noise, is, is really they're calling each other. And, uh, of course, they don't have the benefit of social media and uh, all that to communicate with each other like we humans do. So they have to use their sound mechanism to communicate with the opposite sex. And so this is a way in which the males and females find each other. And of course, when the cicadas emerge, the adults, which you see there, they basically have two things on their bucket lists. Number one, get acquainted with the opposite sex. And number two, reproduce. Because the, an individual adult's only going to live uh, maybe a few weeks and then they die. And of course, uh, during that time, they have to mate and lay eggs. Now, you'll notice that the, in this picture here, that the periodical, uh, first of all, is a jet black, sh almost shiny black insect. They have bright red eyes and they have burnt orange wings. That's much different, different in appearance compared to the uh, annual cicada, which we uh, have every year. Um, which is a much larger cicada. It has uh, the green and black markings on the dorsal surface and then that silver underbelly and clear wings. So appearance is much different. And of course, the periodicals are going to be out. We anticipate sometime here early to mid May, maybe late May, depends what the weather does. Um, whereas the annual, of course, is out later in the summer, usually July and August. And that's when you hear it about the time school starting and, and it can be you know fairly noisy at times too. Um, you also notice on this adult, the front pair of legs have very large femurs, which similar to our femurs in humans, very large. Of course, that's a carryover from the nymphal stage where they've actually had to crawl out of the soil, dig out of the soil to emerge. Uh, but the timing of the year, the size of the insect, and then another thing that's quite unique about the periodical is that they're only known to North America. Uh, the annual, of course, it has a global distribution, but the periodical that we know here is only found in North America. Next slide, please. So, as I mentioned earlier, um, we don't know exactly when they're going to come out. I was here for the 1990 emergence and, of course, the 2007. So this is my third rodeo. Uh, but uh, in those two years, two events, we typically saw them the latter half of May, even into the first part of June. This year, who knows? We've had a very mild winter. Uh, we're running at least as far as uh, plant phenology and other uh, outdoor you know, uh, development. We're running probably about a month ahead. Uh, 
it was mentioned earlier that I do a lot of work for the state with uh, traveling the state and I'm having to up my trapping program uh, for those uh, for insects at least by a month. Normally I wouldn't be worrying about getting out till the early uh, middle part of May, but this year I've had to get out much earlier because things are much farther along, particularly in Southern Illinois. So some work that they did uh, back in Maryland, uh, Mike Ropp, colleague of mine there, work they did in 20, uh, 2020 in Maryland, uh, they determined that uh, 64 degrees Fahrenheit at the eight inch depth was a pretty good measure of uh, emergence. And you can see the formula there. Basically, they uh, did extensive research on this and developed a formula that would correlate with the emergence period. <clears throat> and you can see the T there in that formula refers to the mean April temperatures. That's in centigrade. But that translates into 64 degrees Fahrenheit. They used this same model in Ohio and got a very high correlation, very high relationship uh, with that temperature. So we're going to be monitoring that as well here in Illinois to see how, how we do here. Uh, and we're going to uh, be looking at emergence at the Arboretum. I know right now, statewide, we're running uh, in the upper 40s, low 50s for soil temperatures. Now, granted, a day like today, things are going to warm up. But also uh, keep in mind that uh, really wet soils, which we had a lot of rain last the last couple of weeks, we've got more rain forecast for this week, that may slow down the warming process because it takes a lot more energy to evaporate water out of the soil and to warm those soils up. This is much different than what we had in 2012. If you remember, we had the 2012 drought and you know, we were had very warm soil temperatures that year uh, because the soils were quite dry and it takes a lot, a lot less energy to, to uh, heat up air than it does water. So we'll have to keep an eye on that. That may slow things down a little bit uh, in terms of uh, calendar dates. They're also uh, determined at the, in the Kentucky, Ohio emergence that uh, between 500 and 600 degree days, base 50 uh, was pretty close to when they started seeing em uh, emergence. Now we're uh, here in Northern Illinois, we're kind of approaching 100 degree days, so we've got a ways to go. Now we, of course, pick up a lot today because we're up near 80 today, and I think they're only get, it's going to get down to 50s tonight. So if we use today as an example for calculating degree days, which basically is just a measure of warmth, we have a high of 80 today. Let's say it only gets down to 50 tonight. That's 130. Divide that by two. Our average temperature for this 24-hour period would be 65 which would be uh, 15 degree days. We take the average temperature for a given 24 hour period and subtract 50 degrees or compare it to 50 degrees, which is our developmental threshold. If we have an average temperature of 51 degrees or greater, then we accumulate degree days. If we are 50 or less, then it goes down as a zero. So for April 14th, 2024, we would have 15 degree days and we keep a running total going. Uh, and that helps us predict where insects are as development wise. And of course, it can also be used for plants. We use 50 degrees because that's pretty much considered the uh, minimum temperature for uh, physiological development insects. Once we get below 50 degrees, the upper 40s, they really don't do anything physiologically. They just kind of sit there. So that's why we use 50 degrees. Now, if you're looking at plants, plant phenology, then that can be down as low as in the upper 30s, low 40s, because they will undergo some type of development, even at those low temperatures. And you can see the day of the year is uh, a mean of 150. So if you're figuring 30 days per month, that's about May. It's about where that comes out. Now, in terms of what to watch for, uh, if you go, we'll go from left to right here, the far left, you will see the emergence holes and they will tend to build these chimneys as we call them, little uh, soil like chimneys from where they're emerging from. So that's in your second picture from the left. Obviously you're going to see the newly emerged adults. Uh, they will not look their characteristic color when they first come out. Uh, they have to wait for the wings to dry they have to wait for them to expand and for the pigments in their exoskeleton, that outer skeleton, to 
develop and give them their characteristic color, which is what you're going to see on the far right. Another factor that's going to play into this is what kind of overnight temperatures we have during an, the emergence event. Um, I can remember back in 1990 at the Arboretum, we had some nights down in there in the upper 30s, low 40s. A lot of the cicadas, I'd go back the next morning and look at them, they'd be on the trunk of a tree and they might be partially emerged from the uh, nymphal shell. They might have made it out, but then they couldn't expand their wings. Their wings were distorted because it wasn't warm enough for those wings to be expanded and for them to dry. So a lot of them, uh, you know, never made it. They didn't survive. Um, I always liken uh, emergence of any insect is comparable to childbirth in humans. It's a very stressful event. Uh, it's the insect is extremely vulnerable during this time. They cannot fly. They cannot defend themselves. And so they're easy targets for predators. That's one of the reasons why we think they emerge at overnight or at least late, late night, early morning to avoid predators. But they are very uh, vulnerable and very susceptible to their environment once they come out. And so we may, depending on what kind of overnight temperatures we have, we may, may a lot of them may not survive. So that's uh, something we'll have to keep an eye on as well. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, like the most of a lot of our insects that we have out there, particularly our sap feeding insects, the periodical cicada has what we call gradual or incomplete development. Uh, they go through an egg stage. Of course, that's uh, what will happen later this summer when the females lay their eggs. Those nymphs are gonna drop to the ground. Uh, they'll either, uh, ride the twig down to the ground that they're in, that the eggs have been laid in, woody twigs and branches of plants. Um, they will spend the next 17 years there, or if you will, 16 years and, and 11 months. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, at the end of that period, uh, they will emerge as adults. So you can see, of course, we have the adult there on the left, the nymphal shell, which people call them shells, it's really an exoskeleton. Um, which you know we see every year for the annuals. It's the same thing here with the periodicals. And you can see the wings along the side of the body there where they've developed. Um, that insect has to shed that exoskeleton and emerge as an adult. And again, you can see the real powerful, uh, very large uh, femur there on the front pair of legs that they use for digging. Eyes are pretty small relative to the rest of the body because you're spending most of their time underground uh, and you know, basically in the dark. Next slide, please. So the adults are gonna come out, as you can see there in the upper left. Uh, they will feed for a, a little bit of time. You can see the uh, piercing sucking mouth part there that's inserted into the twig or branch. Uh, they'll take, you know, some substance there to, to uh, you know, be able to have the energy to do what they need to do. But then the real event will be the oviposition or egg laying process. And you can see there in the upper right that uh, structure that comes off the towards the posterior end of the insect, that's the ovipositor. They will use that to cut uh, slits in the uh, twigs and branches of woody plants. You can see a picture, some examples there in that center picture. Uh, and they will lay the eggs then in that, those wounds, nice neat rows, lower left, and once those eggs hatch, then you have, of course, the nymphs on the far right that will uh, stay in that twig until it breaks off and drops to the ground. Or they may drop out on their own and find their way to the soil where they'll tunnel in. And that's the last we'll see of them until uh, 2041, at least up here. On large trees, well, you know, mature trees, uh, large shrubs, plants that are well established and doing fine, you'll see what we call flagging. That's in the in the bottom center picture there. That'll probably show up typically late July, August. Uh, depends on what kind of summer we have. If we have a drought like we had last summer, hot, dry weather, it may show up more, uh, might show up earlier. But basically because of the slits that they cut in the twigs and branches, the portion of that twig or branch distal towards the tip is going to die. And of course the foliage will turn brown and in some cases those twigs uh, will break off and fall to the ground. It'll kind of look like squirrel damage or 
Uh, we have insects called twig girdlers that will do the same thing, but that's, we call that flagging, but it's not going to be harmful to, to mature trees or mature plants, uh, should not be an issue. We kind of call it natural pruning. Now, where we will potentially see some problems uh, could be on smaller plants, particularly some shrubs, uh, and also some very young trees uh, that are and maybe the size of your thumb up to about two inches uh, in diameter in terms of the trunk. And I'll be talking about some of those critical diameters here in a minute. But otherwise, you're just going to see some flagging towards the end of the year and of the summer. Uh, next slide, please. So as we mentioned, the adult feeding damage will be minimal. Um, and you can see again on the right there, the ovipositor. Uh, cutting those slits in the twigs and branches and laying those eggs. Uh, each female can lay about 20 eggs at a given time. Uh, they lay about 20 of them in these nests, as we call them, which are, again is a slit or a cut in the woody parts of the plant. Uh, and over the course of her lifetime, she can lay about 600 eggs. Now, they have to really produce a lot of offspring because obviously there's going to be a lot of predation, and they have to ensure that the species, of course, survives to emerge 17 years later. So uh, it's a lot of lot of reproductive activity there to ensure that that insect continues on. Uh, next slide, please. So we're talking about egg hatch occurring approximately six to 10 weeks after they're laid. So let's just assume that we see an emergence here in late May, and early June, uh, probably by about the second week of July, uh, most of the uh, egg hatching will have started. Uh, again, those uh, nymphs then will drop to the ground or they will uh, stay in the twig or branch till it breaks off and find their way to the very fine feeder roots of trees and begin the feeding process. Uh, the main damage we're going to see above ground uh, will be from, of course, the old position egg laying process by the female. Um, and again, that will be a function of, um, you know, the type of plant that's involved and the, the size of the stems or trunks. Next slide, please. So do they like native or exotics? Well, we don't totally understand host preference on a lot of insects, to be quite honest with you. And cicadas are no, no uh, exception to that rule. We still don't. And of course, we only get to look at them every 17 years. So. Uh, we're going to try to beef up our uh, and add to our arboretum survey. We did that back in 1990, um, where we didn't really find any significant differences between native and exotic plants in terms of preference for egg laying. We are going to follow that up again this year because in the last 34 years, there's been a lot of uh, different plants added to the collections at the arboretum, uh, both exotics and natives. So we're going to update that list and see if there's if there any big changes. They did do a study in Delaware a few years back. They did find native, non-natives were slightly more favored, but nothing real dramatic. So you can pretty much assume any type of woody plant out there that has a critical diameter um, is, is going to be fair game. The other thing that's been kind of interesting in several peer-reviewed articles I've read uh, has to do with plant architecture. In other words, what, how's, what kind of silhouette or what kind of structure does a plant present? And they basically found that bushy shrubs had uh, more uh, egg nests, if you will, on the, on the plant as a whole. But when you started looking at individual stems, uh, there were fewer wounds. And it makes sense. I mean, they have more stems there to work with. The, the uh, number of stems kind of tend to dilute the density of the egg nests themselves. So bushy shrubs may see a little bit more oppositional rate uh, as opposed to a coarse uh, stemmed plant uh, or tree like a Kentucky coffee tree or some of those where they just have a few uh, branches, they may see more egg nests per branch because of that uh, plant architecture. Next slide, please. So the plants that tend to be preferred, and I will use the word preferred here, it doesn't mean that this is, these are the only plants that they will focus on. Uh, we do, as entomologists, we do consider cicadas generalists. In other words, they have a very broad host range. We have other insects out there that have very narrow host ranges, uh, even within just one genus, just like we saw with uh, the emerald ash borer with Fraxinus, the ash. 
So apple, hickory, maple, oaks, these are going to be preferred. We don't know why, but they're preferred. That's where we see, you know, considerable egg, egg laying activity. But they also will go after birch, dogwood, walnut, willow, lindens, and elms. So those can be other potential hosts as well. Uh, on the exotic side, of course, members of the rose family, Cotoniaster, Forsythia, Ginkgo, uh, pears, and your um, lilacs also have that potential. If you have conifers uh, or any of the sumacs, which is the bruce species, uh, you're not likely to uh, see any issues there. Uh, they do not like to try to lay eggs in the um, conifer species because of the resin. Uh, makes it very difficult for the eggs to uh, hatch and for the nymphs to escape that resin. So that usually has a very high mortality rate. Also, uh, some of your gummier species, uh, your prunus, uh, peach plum, cherry, has, they have a lot of gummosis. Uh, gummy sap, and so they tend to stay away from those along with persimmon. So these are ones that typically do not have uh, any significant uh, egg laying damage. Next slide, please. Some of your conifers that have more flexible um, needles or foliage, uh, your hemlocks, junipers, arborvitas, they may see some damage uh, again, resin plays a role here and sap, but because the uh, stems are more flexible and pliable, it makes it a little easier for the females to reach the uh, twigs and branches. And of course, the needle arrangement on those makes a big difference too. Now, if you have really stout twigs and branches and needles that go completely around the branch, like you see on pines and spruces and firs, that's kind of like trying to cozy up to a a uh, porcupine if you're trying to get close to the, the uh, twig or branch. So these typically, along with the resin, are typically not uh, affected very much at all, which is, is a good thing because we know that if we kill branches or, or lose needles on a conifer, they don't, they don't refoliate like our deciduous plants. Uh, next slide, please. So the critical diameter here that we need to look at, if you're having concerns about any new plants that you put in. And I want to, do want to say uh, they're only going to attack woody plants. There's no evidence that they attack any herbaceous plants. So they're not going to bother your flowers or your vegetables or anything like that. Now, if you have a, a really fibrous plant, uh, even though it's a herbaceous plant, they might attempt to, to egg lay there. Uh, but typically they're only interested in woodies. So as I said before, uh, after the egg laying event takes place and that twig or branch dies from that egg uh, nest distally out towards the tip, then you're going to see some breakage, um, snapping off of small twigs and branches. It may see some of those uh, littering under the trees. But the real critical diameter, at least based on our work at the Arboretum in 1990 and also the literature, indicates that anything uh, over an eighth of an inch up to just a little bit under a half inch um, is going to be pretty much fair game for oval position or egg laying. So if you have a, a young tree, for instance, that has a trunk that is in that range, you might gonna probably need to consider protecting it. Um, we saw damage in 90 at the ARB. Uh, we had some very small elm and maple whips in the nursery, and they pretty well worked those over. In fact, they had to cut them back uh, about back down to about six to eight inches and have them regrow because they damaged them pretty heavily. Uh, so any of your shrubs, any of your trees that um, fall into that range could see some damage. Now that said, something I've been trying to impress upon people is what kind of activity did you have 17 years ago? If you were living in at, at your location 17 years ago, what kind of cicada activity did you have? Was it very minimal? Was it heavy? What's, and of course, what has taken place in that last, last 17 years? Because uh, if you've had development or areas that have been disturbed or habitat uh, destroyed, then you may not have as many cicadas. So that's really the first thing you kind of need to think about. Now, if you weren't there 17 years ago, then hopefully you can find some neighbors or some other people that lived in the area that could give you some indication of what the 
emergence level was, because that will be very important in determining whether you need to protect plants. There may be some areas that you won't hardly see any cicadas at all. If you're next to a natural area, say a forest preserve or an area that has not been disturbed, uh, then and they were and if they were there at the previous emergence, then yes, you're probably going to see a similar type of uh, level of activity. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, we did some studies in 90. We looked at about 140 exotic and native woody plant genera at the Arboretum. We also did an uh, urban forest uh, parkway tree study. We looked at about 14 different species there. Bottom line, uh, most of your plants healed over, calloused over the wounds within one to two growing seasons. Uh, most of them was no big deal. They healed up very quickly. We did have some that were, took a little bit longer. Um, and you can see the list there. I won't read all those to you, but I think those are all very common species. And of course, obviously, the type of growing conditions you have, the growing season, if, if you have a year like last year where the first half of the summer was a drought, then that's going to delay healing because that's that's a process that plants have to have resources to be able to do that. As we say, they have to have money to pay the bills. So if they can't make money, i.e. photosynthates from photosynthesis, then that's going to slow everything down. But in most cases, if the uh, plant is has reasonable health and has good growing conditions, they should heal up uh, you know, pretty quickly. We did not, we followed these plants up for small well, three or four years after the fact. We did not see any significant issues with any of the plants, no plant mortality. Uh, we didn't see any cankers develop, pathogens, insect issues or anything. So uh, yes, we saw the, the flagging, the pruning, as I mentioned earlier, but that was really the extent of uh, the damage. Next slide, please. Some people have asked, what about all these nymphs? feeding on the tree roots. Uh, research has shown that there's really no major effect. Uh, they did a study here where they looked at a number of different species of trees. You can see sugar maple and, and uh, white ash, pen oak, black oak, and sassafras. One of the studies they saw that in three of these species, a little bit of a reduction in growth the year of or a year after the emergence. Um, but again, the tree plants recovered and some the other uh, species um, had an increase in growth uh, five years following the cicada emergence event. So point here is that we're not, there's no real major impact by nymphal feeding. Um, keep in mind, those nymphs have to keep that plant alive because that's their meal ticket. So if they kill the plant, they're going to be in trouble and they're not going to, you know, move very far in the soil, either vertically or horizontally once they're, they're in position. So they have to make sure they don't overwhelm the plant. And you're talking about a, a co-evolutionary event here that's been going on for millennia. So I think they've got it figured out. So we don't really expect any issues that way as well. Uh, I guess a tree that was extremely stressed uh, might show some effect, but that's going to be more environmentally related, I think. Drought, flooding, whatever, as compared to the actual insects feeding. Next slide, please. So what are we suggesting? I personally and professionally, and my colleagues are as well, enjoy the event. This is only going to be going on for a few weeks. It only happens every 17 years. I've had people come up to me, you know, and they're very concerned about all these insects. And I say, do you have any children? Yeah, I've got a toddler. I've got a two or three year old. Well, to give it some perspective, the next time this happens, they're going to be young adults. So enjoy it. Make the most of it. It is a unique biological event. Uh, the cicada has the longest life cycle of any insect we're aware of. And again, it's a very short-lived uh, event when it all comes down to it, when you think about how much time they spend below ground. If you can, if it's possible, if you can avoid uh, spring plantings, wait till fall, that would be great. Uh, I know some organizations have plant sales going on. I know one in particular, they have a, a lilac sale going on here. And so they're going to, you know, you'll probably have to uh, net some of those plants, uh, protect them if you're in an area where you're going to have cicadas emerging. But if you can hold off till fall, that would be uh, much better. Or even wait till the uh, cicada activity has ceased, which you're going to know it. It's going to get real quiet again, normal decibels. And uh, if you can water the plant, it's, you know, it's not unbelievably dry and hot and you can take care of the plant, nurse it along, then that's fine too. 
If neither one of those options are a possibility, then yes, you probably are going to have to cover the plant with some kind of netting. Now, um, as I understand it, Hobby Lobby and a lot of the stores have sold out on their uh, bridal veil and other netting uh, because of the demand or people are just buying it up. So you may have to go to Amazon or some of the other online sources, but you want to get a netting that's fine enough that the cicada can't get through. And by that, we're probably talking something in the eight to a quarter inch mesh size. You, if you get much larger than that, they could probably squeeze through it and get to the plant. When you do cover the plant, you want to, of course, cover the canopy and draw the net down around the trunk as close to the ground as possible so they can't get up underneath or do damage to the trunk. Now, some of you may say, well, I've, I've got lots of plants. I can't do that. Okay. I have a colleague in, in the war zone, as I call it, down in central Illinois that has a very small oak arboretum, and he's got hundreds of young oak trees out there that he can't net all of them. But what he's going to do is try to protect the, the central leader, the main leader of the tree, and take his chances on the rest of it because he can't net all of the trees and do the entire tree. So that's a strategy he and I kind of worked out this winter how we might approach this. So that's the plan there. Again, please make sure you remove that netting. I know that may sound kind of a stupid comment, but you'd be amazed. People will leave wrap on the trunks. They will leave netting on trees. I've seen people plant plants in the pot, in a plastic pot in the ground. So please remove that netting. Uh, that way you minimize foliar diseases because you're getting air circulation and you're not, um, uh, you know, creating an environment for a lot of your pathogens. Uh, next slide, please. We are not recommending any kind of insecticide. <clears throat> now, back in 1990, we did not have the systemic insecticides that we have today. They weren't available. We didn't have any way to really deliver them to the tree. A lot of that came about uh, due to Asian longhorn beetle and emerald ash borer. But more importantly than that, we did not, the study they did in Maryland, again, in, in uh, I believe it was 2005, they did not see any benefit from the uh, systemic insecticides. As it says there, it didn't have any impact on the uh, cicada adults landing on the plant, or did it have any impact on uh, egg laying or egg hatch? Plus the fact that there's always, particularly with a contact insecticide, there's always a possibility of collateral damage, killing off beneficials, pollinators, and so forth. So we're not recommending any insecticide treatments. We don't feel they're effective. We didn't find contact sprays effective in 90 either, uh, some studies we did there. So obviously you can do what you want. There's nothing illegal about it, but we don't recommend it. We don't think it's, it's really that effective. In fact, the study in Maryland, they found the netting was, was just as effective as any kind of insecticide treatment. As I mentioned earlier, you will get some natural pruning late in the summer on mature trees, some terminal branch flagging. But other than that, that's all the damage you're going to see on mature plants. Uh, next slide, please. So that's the nuts and bolts of it. Uh, I'll be glad to entertain any questions uh, related to this. So 